So it's with great pleasure I introduce Caitlin today and to present evidence and tell the story of a dynamic and changing Anglo-Saxon and medieval Lincolnshire coastline. So Caitlin, if you'd like to take it away. Okay, I should be unmuted. <laughs> right, uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, yes, you said dynamic. I mean, it certainly is. It's, it really is one of the most interesting coastlines in Britain. If you, if you look around the coastline, the differences and changes that have taken place over the last 1,500 years along here, which is roughly the period we're going to be dealing with, the first thousand years of that anyway, um, we're, they're, they're just enormous. As we'll see, there's dramatic changes elsewhere on the coastline, but they're dwarfed, I would argue, by what we see on the Lincolnshire coastline, um, which is really quite fascinating, as I hope you agree. We're going to start looking at some maps just to get a feel for the area we're looking at. And I'm going to look at the earliest detailed map of the Lincolnshire coastline to begin with. Um, if it'll there we go. This is the earliest detailed map of the Lincolnshire coastline. It was drawn around about the year 1150 in uh, Sicily by the great um, Islamic scholar al Idrisi. Um, and earlier maps tended to show England as a blob uh, with very little detail whatsoever. But this one, this actually shows quite a lot. This is an original Arabic 14th century copy. Um, I've got a, um, from the uh, French National Library. I've got a um, transcribed version for those whose Arabic is rusty. Um, there we go. Um, the interesting thing about Arabic map making, map making is that um, the top of the map here is south. So the east coast is on the left here. And the river that you see running um, horizontally from uh, the left is the River Witham. It's got Boston near its entrance, and then it flows through uh, Nicholas, which is the um, Anglo-Norman medieval name for Lincoln. And Lincoln is the only city shown on the map um, to have a river flowing through the middle of it, which in fact the River Witham did do in the medieval period with the southern suburb of Wigford and then the old Roman city on the north. Going back to the coastline, as you go north, so south down the left-hand side, you see a Grims, which is Grimsby, and beyond that, York. They don't uh, seem in 12th century Sicily to have known about the north bank of the Humber. And really, they have shown very little interest in anything um, south of Yarmouth and um, north of Grimsby, which is quite intriguing. It suggests that Lincolnshire was seen as an area of particular interest that they seem to have had accurate information about this area and not very much about the rest of England. Um, and the slightly later one gives us a little more interest. You'll notice on the first one, um, the Arabic map, there is no sign of the wash whatsoever. But when we get to 14th century, there you are, there is the wash. Again, south is at the top here. Um, the wash is named here as the Gulfo de San Bator, um, or the Gulf of Boston. Um, this seems to be the earliest recorded name for this area of water. Uh, the wash doesn't actually come into use until the 16th century. You can then see, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse at all, but um, on what would be the north side of the wash, um, you can see what looks like Gibraltar Point almost. That is actually though um, an earlier version of Gibraltar Point that formed near Skegness, as we will see in a minute. And then below that, you've got the River Humber, and then uh, that says Ravenstall. We'll come back to that place. It is a pirate island, and I'll hopefully get a chance to tell you a little more about the pirate island of Ravenstall later on. Um, we go a little bit further, you get a bit more detail. So this is a 14th century goth map. Um, this time, east is at the top. Uh, you've got Grimsby in the top left-hand corner. Then you've got Fleet, which you can just about read there. That's Salt Fleet. Um, then you've got Wayne Fleet and Boston going around the coast. So they're starting to add a few more details in. But really, it's not a great deal of use for coastal history at this point. The maps are interesting to tell us where the important settlements were. And they tell us that the Mediterranean scholars in Sicily thought that Lincolnshire was significantly more important than most other places on the East Coast. But beyond that, it's not really telling us much. So what exactly was going on? Well, 
When it comes to the East Coast, one of the classic studies is to go and look at the East Riding. Um, looking north of Lincolnshire in East Yorkshire, there's evidence for a significant degree of erosion and land loss. Uh, Thomas Shepherd's Lost Towns of Yorkshire Coast, the map that I'm showing you there is based on, uh, redrawn by me. Um, it documents 29 settlements that have been lost to the sea up there. I and mean, the current estimate is around six kilometres have been lost, which explains to you why there's, we get quite so many problems nowadays um, in the Scarborough area and so on with coastal erosion, where it's been even worse in the past there. The situation in Lincolnshire is somewhat similar but it's also quite a lot more complicated, however. At the start of the medieval era, there seems to have been a complete opposite situation to what you've got in East Yorkshire. East Yorkshire is a continuous tale of the gradual erosion of those clay cliffs. Um, that's not what we've got here. Instead, at the end of the Roman period, there seems to have been a massive encroachment by the sea that we now date to around the fourth to sixth centuries. At Ingermells, the Roman salt workings are found below a metre or so of um, marine silt that were deposited on top of them. At Scupholm, near to Saltfleet, you've got um, a Roman settlement buried under 12 foot of marine silt that have been deposited. There were, we can now think that most of the outmarsh, the top layer of it, is laid down in this period um, and became a very wide band of uh, coastal marshes. You've got two different reconstructions there, one by me um, on the left and one by David Robinson on the right. Um, you'll see in both cases, you have these islands out to sea, which no longer exist. We'll come back to them a little bit more, but we can be fairly confident they were there because the kind of wide coastal marshes that existed for the next 500 years on this coast nearly they would have required the kind of calming influence that those islands would have provided. It protected the Lincolnshire coastline, those islands offshore, from the kind of erosive for, uh, forces that we see in East Yorkshire. Um, this is a zoom in based on the British Geological Survey. The green and the pink here, uh, pink is gravel, green is our glacial till, and you can see, and the yellow is the area that would have flooded around about the beginning of the Anglo-Saxon period. One of those islands has produced that rather beautiful Anglo-Saxon gold pendant that you can see there. I won't tell you exactly which one, but one of them seems to have an Anglo-Saxon settlement and cemetery on it at least. Um, others, we've got excavated um, settlement sites and cemeteries. So these are in the Anglo-Saxon period, islands in the middle of the coast marsh of dry land. They were inhabited, people were living on them. Um, give you a nice, very inland example, you may have come across Little Carlton um, in the news a few years ago. Um, a m very important Anglo-Saxon, Middle Saxon, so that's around about 7th to 9th century settlement, excavated on an island um, in the marshland. Um, if you look at the coastal reconstruction on the top left there, you can see that a massive marine estuary would have come right up to the island site at Little Carton, despite it being perhaps 10 kilometres inland now, um, and then branched around the island site. We now think it may have been some kind of monastic site. We've got evidence for landing areas there and some amazing artefacts, including vast numbers of um, pieces of writing equipment, that blue glass object is the base of an ink pot. And then we've got other glass, evidence of glass working, such as that black one that seems to uh, have an interesting cross design put in in glass there. So it's incredibly important site. It was effectively an island on the very edge of a coastal zone, but look how far inland it currently is. That's the difference we're talking about. And this was it's functioning with its landing places and everything else into the early ninth century, that kind of era. Um, there we go. However, unlike in East Yorkshire, this is not spell that one, a simply a tale of the loss of land. The process seems to go into reverse around that ninth century period, so that the new flat alluvial plain we've got all the way down our coastline begins to be occupied from perhaps the late ninth and tenth centuries. Now we can see that in various ways. One of the best ways has been to uh, look at the place names. 
Um, differences in naming between the Middle Saxon coast and what might be called the Late Saxon. So Middle Saxon coast up to the 9th century, Late Saxon up to the 11th century. Green are the names which are effectively pre-Viking, so pre-mid to late 9th century in date. And you can see virtually all the settlements down the um, coast as it was in that period are named in Old English, the, uh, the language that becomes our modern um, language named uh, spoken by the Anglo-Saxons. However, once you go out into the marshland, the outmarsh, you see that there's very few names that actually are of Old English, Anglo-Saxon origin, instead they're of Old Norse or even French origin, um, suggesting they were founded significantly later. And the two green dots you do have down there both have coat in them, north coats and summer coats, indicating probably seasonal usage. So they may relate to the period when that was a coastal marsh area, and that's perhaps where people were staying while engaging in salt making, for example, or possibly grazing. But the major settlements out there, your Grain Fork, your uh, Federal Fork, your Salt Fleet, be, these are all Viking era names, suggesting 10th, 11th centuries is when this process goes into reverse. You've got to support this from the archaeology and the written sources. Um, the red star you can see, that is the earliest post-Roman salt production site that we know of from this coastline. Um, it was discovered at Marsh Chapel and excavated about 20 years, maybe slightly longer ago now. Um, in order to make salt with the process being used there, it would have had to be open to the sea. So you can see that around the end of the ninth century, the sea was still almost coming up to that, the marsh, um, the middle marsh villages now of Cockrington and Yarborough and um, so on. However, you go out to the late 10th centuries, 100 years, 150 years later, and the yellow and the green stars come into play. Those, the yellow star is a late 10th or early 11th century Anglo-Saxon sculpture from Conisholm. That means the King's Island or something similar. And there was a church founded on there, implying that there was permanent settlement, not this kind of seasonal occasional usage, but permanent settlement by the beginning of the 11th century, about the year 1000. Grain Fork, even better example, it's mentioned in Doomsday Book um, as not only the site of six 11th century sultans, the salt making, but also a permanent settlement with soakmen, villains who were farming the land, plows and meadow land. So that tells us by the time you get to the end of the 11th century, this is now a farmed and permanently settled landscape. Um, it probably is roughly the same period back into the 10th century, maybe, that Salt Fleet and Federal Fork get established. And we've got some lovely finds. This is one of my favourite finds from the Lincolnshire coast. It's an early 11th century spindle wall found at Salt Fleet by St Clement in 2010. And the, this would be used for by somebody weaving. Um, it's made of lead, ever so, ever so tiny. Um, and it's got the name of Odin and various other Norse divinities carved into it, along with some kind of prayer, implying that not only do we have Vikings here, but some remembrance, perhaps, of Viking pagan religion still existed out here. And it suggests, because of the weaving, that we've got permanent settlement here from the early 11th century at Salt Fleetby. I love that find. It's absolutely magnificent. Fascinating article by John Hines recently on that. Um, now, we've mentioned salt making already. Salt making in the area played a major role in all of this. Gradually, it moved eastwards. Uh, you can see this from the lovely 1595 map of Fullstow and Marsh Chapel. I've got an extract of it there for you. You can see on the right hand side, which is closest to the sea, the mounds of waste from the salt production. Um, those are the new ones for still active salt producing sites. And you can see the ghosts of them further to the west. But what they're doing is new lines of salt production. And then when they're exhausted and the, um, the sea is not getting there efficiently, they move to another line further seawards. And then when that becomes exhausted, they move to another line further seawards. So these salt amounts are some of them six metres high, 20 metres across. They act like dry islands in the coastal marshes, but gradually they, the land between them becomes reclaimed. It becomes part of this odd hilly landscape that you can see on the landward edge of the coastal zone. Now, this is 
particularly prevalent in the northern part of the Lindsay Marsh, but you can also see it down in the south, um, particularly around the tops. And there's also some evidence for it elsewhere that I hope to be able to look at in a little more detail on the occasion. Um, but you can see it really nicely using LIDAR. LIDAR is um, light shot down to measure these tiny differences in height. And that just gives you an example of what it looks like at Marsh Chapel. You can see that matches, if I just flip back to the previous map, which was drawn in 1595, that matches with the um, top right of that map almost exactly. Um, so you can see very good draft skills back in the 16th century on the Lincolnshire Marsh. So this is a fundamentally different picture from what we get further north in Yorkshire. So what was different, what changed? Well, I've mentioned the coastal barrier of islands. They're first suggested by Swinerton in 1931. They're thought to have been destroyed in the 13th century. And um, the debris that resulted from their destruction is believed to have then been cast upon the foreshore of the uh, Lincoln Trout Marsh as these broad storm beaches and sand dunes that we have there. And some dating evidence does suggest at least some of the sand dunes do date back to around about the 13th century on our coastline. Um, this is a geological map of the summer coats area and those storm beaches up there you can see um, that North Summercoats is built upon. Those may well have been cast up partly from the destruction of these large barrier islands that effectively kept our coast safe from the erosive power of the North Sea and stopped the sea grinding away at us like it did consistently from the Roman period onwards in East Yorkshire. Now, uh, this is what Simon Pawley has to say about it, which I think is quite a nice quote. Um, a coastline sheltered for four and a half millennia and topographically and geologically unprepared for the experience because we're used to very slow, gentle tides on this coastline, allowing these massive salt marshes to build up, was now exposed to whatever forces of tide and weather had formerly operated on the line of barrier islands. More floods and coastal disasters were the inevitable result. And this is absolutely true. And I would argue it's even worse than that because much of this land was only recently reclaimed. As we've seen, the reclamation really is getting underway in the 10th, 11th centuries, certainly in the northern part. So this has not been solid land for very long, really. And suddenly it's suffering from these new stormy conditions. And these had a tremendous effect. Uh, this is from the Louth Park Abbey Chronicle, 1287, about Mabel Thorpe St. Peter, which was apparently rent asunder by the waves of the sea. Uh, the Hagnaby Abbey Chronicle similarly relates that the church of St. Mabel, uh, St. Peter at Mabel Thorpe was destroyed. The chalice in which the body of Christ was um, found crushed under a heap stones and there's a nice contemporary painting of St Elizabeth's flood of 1421 on the continent give you an idea these floods getting all the way into Olvingham almost in this period um, it's not just Mablethorpe incidentally and Lincolnshire's Barry Islands that are swept away in December 1247 in um, the Netherlands you have St Lucia's flood Killed 50,000 to 80,000 people over there, meteorologically similar to the North Sea flood of 53, and it changed the landscape of the Netherlands, making that large inland sea you can see in the early map there. Uh, that sea is still present, and that was caused by the 13th century flooding. Um, so both sides of the North Sea were seeing massive changes to the landscape in this 13th century, the stormy century, as it's been called. Uh, things got even worse in the next year, according to the Hagnaby Abbey Chronicle. A flood of a sea reached as far as Maltby Field, Maltby La Marche, totally destroyed the Church of St. Peter of Mablethorpe, and that day perished many men, uncounted sheep, and an unknown number of cattle. And the sea caused very great damage in the territory of Mablethorpe, and there is a nice, con well, near contemporary uh, woodcut of people being affected by slightly later um, flooding events into the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, the Church of St. Peter at Mablethorpe, um, the village of Mablethorpe and the greater part of its parish, which were overflown by the water in the sea and never recovered. Um, Mablethorpe, one part of Mablethorpe, moved inland to where the Green Star is, the current St. Mary's Church. Mablethorpe St. Peter wasn't so lucky. As late as the 1870s, the church ruins could still be seen from the dune top. 
um, where there's the car park now near the cinema. Um, and it was said in the 1930s that the sea continued to occasionally throw carved stone from the church onto the foreshore. Local metal detectorists tell me that at very, very low tide, you can go out there and pick up late medieval and early modern um, belt buckles, pieces of buckets and various other things out there still. So the evidence is still out there, um, but a long way out nowadays. Um, so if you look out to the wave of breakers out there at very low tide, it's a little way beyond that, probably. And um, that's taken from the top of that car park overlooking um, on the dunes there at Mablethorpe. Um, Old Skegness suffers a similar fate in the late medieval to early modern period. There is um, fairly good evidence now that there was some kind of persistent sandbank, a bit like the Summercoats persistent sandbank out at Skegness, right from the prehistoric period onwards. And it looks like there was some kind of Roman fort there based on the land's mention of a town wall having also a castle and field names suggestive of a Roman site, as well as the doomsday name for Skegness, Trick, which we think derives from the Latin word for ferry or crossing point. Um, we do actually have a small number of finds from the beach, a bit of Roman pottery, but perhaps most interesting is only the um, one of two Roman brothel tokens known from England. Um, the other example, of course, comes from London and was published to great fanfare from the Thames a few years back, but Skegness was there first. We, we were the site of the first find of a Roman brothel token um, in England. Um, so, Skegness may have gone. We don't have to take Leland's word for it, though. Um, he says it, Skegness is a great haven town, and in fact, the wood and wainscots, wooden panelling used for the building of Lord Cromwell's castle at Taff, the Tattershall in the 1430s, was imported by the haven of Skegness, and I do ha now have some nice documentary evidence for it even earlier as an important port. Um, in terms of the settlement being washed away by the sea, there are various complaints about fishermen's nets getting caught in the ruins of a church below the low water mark. So I've got no reason to doubt that this is true. Um, usually suggested that Old Skegness lays off the original end of the pier that was destroyed at the end of the 70s. Um, and that there was a network of dunes and beaches running south from Ingermells which protected that Roman fortification and the church and the small port of Skegness from the sea, where two hamlets from the east and west mills, which were also destroyed in the early 16th century. Uh, that's just an example of what the coastline may have looked like and just how much has been lost. So Mablethorpe St. Peter was lost. Mablethorpe St. Mary had to move inland. Trustthorpe's been lost. Old Sutton's been lost. Mumby Chapel, the original Chapel St. Leonard's, has lost. And Old Skegness was definitely lost. Um, the lands to the south of Skegness, incidentally, their reclamations from about 1555 onwards. Um, up until that point, effectively, Gibraltar Point would have been opposite Skegness itself. Um, Sutton in, on Sea, we have a similar thing. This is an account from 1799. Uh, Joseph Banks visited with a, um, a colleague to examine the petrified forest that you can still see there. At that point, though, it was a mile wide, whereas it's nowhere near as wide nowadays that you can see. Um, while there, they learnt that the inhabitants believed the parish church once stood on the spot where the islets, the um, Petrified Forest now are and was submerged by inroads of the sea. And we've got every reason to think that's the set of the truth. There's um, Sutton's Church, which built in the 19th century, but includes some reused medieval stonework and a medieval font that may well have been rescued from the original lost church that now lies out to sea. And a few years back, some wooden um, um, panelling probably used for fencing or similar was actually recovered and radiocarbon dated to the Middle Saxon period from off the current coastline on the beach at Sutton. Uh, Mumby Chapel is perhaps the most famous. The whole town was lost except three houses. A ship was driven upon a house. The sailors thinking they had been upon a rock committed themselves to God and three of the mariners leapt out of the ship and chanced to take hold of a housetop and so saved themselves. But what, um, 
The wife um, in the house was lying in childbed, but saved herself by climbing on top of a house where the mariners saved her, but her husband and child were both drowned. And Master Pelham lost 1,100 sheep. That's an important point to note, of course. That's from Hollinshed's Chronicle in the late 16th century. Um, so there were, have been tremendous losses. We've got a much more complicated dynamic tale of the coastline round here. Um, it's not all loss in the late medieval period, though. In the last couple of minutes, um, I want us to look at one area where there was um, land growth as well. It's not simply a tale of land being sunken, then reclaimed, and then parts of it being lost again. There's still some new land emerging into the uh, into the 13th, 14th, late medieval period. And we go back to Ravensrod, the place I told you about, as well as destroying the offshore islands and flooding large portions of the Netherlands, the storms of the 13th century created land elsewhere. Uh, this is from a 1290 inquisition. Uh, by the casting up of the sea, a certain small island was born, which is called Ravensrod, which is distant from the town of Grimsby by the space of one tide. And afterwards, fishers dried their nets there, and men, little by little, first began to dwell and stay there. And afterwards, ships laden with diverse kinds of merchandise began to unload and sell there. Ravensrod is marked on the early 14th century map there um, inland, but it was actually, appears to have been an island thrown up by the sea in the mouth of the Humber presumably depositions of the original barrier islands that lay off the Lincolnshire coast may have had played their part there. The exact location is open to some date, uh, debate. It's often believed to have been located east of the present day sperm point in the Humber mouth, and um, was said um, in a 14th century chronicle to have been distant from the mainland a space of one mile and more. That's a um, 1580s map you can just see some of the sands and various small islands that are still in the Humber mouth at that point. You've got the bull um, and various other ones. And down at the bottom, you can see the Spurn head map. This is actually an English version of the Dutch map. The original Dutch map, um, which unfortunately isn't copyright free, is um, shows that as Ravenspurn, preserving part of the old name. Um, but there it's Spurn Head, though, it's been renamed. Um, you may be seeing a comparable situation to what you get in the 17th century with Sunk Island in the Humber. That bit of a Humber that comes out from the North Bank um, starts out as a sand bank, then gradually develops into a dry sand in the 17th century. It's embanked and reclaimed from that point onwards. That's a, uh, an example of it when it was still an island in the middle of the Humber. And we can imagine something similar for Ravensrod. Um, this is Sunk Island. You can see there a nice um, Ottoman map shows it from 1804. And you can see it's gradually become um, gathered to the north bank of the Humber there and something more approximate to what the current north bank of the Humber looks like now can be seen in that map from 1876. Um, it became a parish in 1831. Something similar happened with Ravensrod but it wasn't as long lasting. By 1241 Ravensrod is grown up sufficiently to get market and fair and by 1290 the men of Grimsby were accusing those of Ravensrod of piracy. The claim the Ravensrod men arrest with strong hand any merchant ship heading to Grimsby and by fear and force have compelled and daily do compel them to turn aside to the aforesaid new town and to sell their merchandise there, leading to the growth of Ravensrod and the partial desertion of the port of Grimsby. Um, I think that's the, uh, quite, quite interesting. There you can see the passage highlighted. So that the affair, aforesaid town has been in part deserted. Apparently this pirate island off the coast of Grimsby was so successful in getting people to trade there rather than in Grimsby that parts of Grimsby were abandoned at the end of the uh, 13th century. Nonetheless, the king is not interested. In return for £300 from the uh, people of Ravensrod, he gives them a charter and a 30-day fare. However, the people of Grimsby must have been praying rather hard in the uh, late 13th and early 14th centuries, because by the mid 14th century, the tide quite literally 
begins to turn. This is a writ from 1347 and indicates that the destruction of Ravensarod by the sea had begun in the eighth year of Edward III. So 1335-ish, less than a century after the sea had first thrown up the island and that 200 buildings and properties had been lost in the course of a decade. Um, it was a tremendous rate of destruction. By the time you get to the 1850s, the uh, place is almost completely underwater. The 14th century chronicle relates that the inundations of the sea and of the Humber have destroyed to the foundations the chapel of Ravensrod, built in the honour of the Blessed Virgin Mary, so that the corpses and bones of the dead there horribly appeared, and the same inundations daily threatened the destruction of the said town. So this is an actual borough with a 30-day fair and a royal charter destroyed by the sea in the course of perhaps 20 years. Um, and this is the final verdict on it. The town of Ravensrod in the parish of the said church of Easington uh, was an exceedingly famous brother devoted to merchandise as well as many fisheries, most abundantly furnished with ships and burgesses amongst the brothers of that sea coast, but yet with all inferior places and chiefly because of wrongdoing on the sea by its wicked works and piracies. It provoked the wrath of God against itself beyond measure. Wherefore, within the following years, the said town was destroyed to the foundations. And in fact, there is a record in the court rolls, manor court rolls, suggesting that they were ripping up what was salvageable from the town in 1362. So there you go. A very dynamic coastline indeed. Um, and I would argue one of the most interesting. In the whole of the case. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, no. That's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> that's really cool. Uh, yeah, so such a turbulent history. Um, I had no idea. <laughs> that's really cool. So I wonder if uh, we've got we've got one question from Bob Garland. Um, I think mm -hmm. this is referring to some of your earlier slides. Okay. He asks, Does the occupation of marginal locations indicate peaceful migration rather than invasion? Ooh, there's a question. Um, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, it's certainly been argued to some degree in the past. Um, I think Kevin Leahy always has a nice line that um, he suspects when it comes to the Anglo-Saxon invasions, that the, the view of the ox's backside tramping ahead of you in the field looked the same, um, whoever was in charge of the, uh, of the local estate and, and whatnot, uh, from the Roman period to the Anglo-Saxon. I suspect something similar um, is true in, on the East Coast as well. I think there certainly is some violent um, activity along the coastline in this period. I mean, it's easy to forget that the Vikings primarily were making a lot of their money in this period from slaving. They abduct thousands of people, for example, off the islands of Anglesey that the king has to um, um, ransom back. And vast amounts of um, Islamic silver coinage is coming into the Viking world in this period, which is from them taking people that they have captured in the British Isles and in continental Europe, taking them over to um, central Russia um, and selling them to slave merchants there who then brought them down into the Islamic world. So, you, I mean, um, I, I wouldn't like to discount. The Vikings were not nice people necessarily, but I think at the same time, there is considerable continuity. The difference we've got here, perhaps, is that we have these massive floods that bury the Roman settlements under up to 12 foot of marine sediment, which would have caused major eruptions on the coastline. So perhaps climatic change or um, is, is as important along this coastline as invasion, you could argue. But yeah, it's, it's definitely worth the discussion. Good question. And the next one from Chris. Has the gas and oil industry affected these sites off the coast in a negative way or has it um, un, in fact provided us with more knowledge? Well, there's an interesting question. I mean, certainly to some degree it's been very beneficial. Um, I mean, I, I was looking recently, I've been looking ahead of a project on the whole coastline, looking at the LIDAR data from here and its analysis. And there has been some really interesting work associated with the Triton Knoll and Viking Link work that's 
produce some really interesting stuff that hasn't yet been integrated properly into our into our narrative. So that's valuable. Perhaps the most important um, thing is, however, Doggerland, the Mesolithic um, to Neolithic inhabited coastal plain, which you know. 20 years or so ago, you would map as virtually featureless, apart from a few lakes that you can detect um, that were assumed to be there. But we, due to the gas and oil industry, we can now map in tremendous detail. We can identify hills, we can identify valleys. Um, it's really quite fascinating. So um, from that perspective, there have been enormous benefits in understanding, but that is, um, most of that information lies a good deal off our actual immediate coastline. Another question from Matt. Was there a population shift from the earlier Saxon settlements to the newer settlements as the coastline shifted? A depopulation of the earlier settlements? It's very difficult to tell about depopulation, um, particularly when you're dealing with periods of uh, large population growth, which is what we see in England in general. Um, through to the, uh, the time of the Black Death, when obviously there was a massive population collapse. Uh, Lincolnshire at the time of Doomsday Book is actually um, one of the highest populated areas of the whole of England, along with East Anglia, um, reflecting its importance in that period. Um, so I'm not sure we necessarily would see depopulation, but we can definitely see links. We can certainly see manorial links between those middle marsh marginal villages, which in the Anglo-Saxon period were the coastal villages. They have control in the medieval period of the settlement of the bits of salt marsh, which become the outmarsh immediately opposite them. So, for example, Marsh Chapel is associated with Bullstow, um, Connors Home and Olvingham. These kind of relationships, we've got good documentary evidence. I think we need to see it in terms of a period with considerable population growth. And this was an incredibly valuable resource that the villages on the original coastline would have wanted to control. You've got the salt workings there, but you've also got these immensely rich grazing lands as well. And we can see from even the early 12th century and potentially before the division of the grazing lands into these long thin strips divided by dikes like you see at Salt Fleetby but maybe a mile a mile and a quarter long and they represent they tell us that they're documented back into the early 12th century some of those and they tell us that these grazing lands were as important if you like as the salt making going on so these were valuable lands which the middle marsh villages that used to be coastal villages definitely would have wanted to control. I see. I hope that will answer your question, Matt. Um, brilliant. So, um, yeah, just to let you know, this uh, talk has been made available as part of the Dynamic Dunescapes project. So um, those of you who, who logged on to this webinar probably went through the Dynamic Dunescapes website or the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust website. Um, but Dynamic Dunescapes, its aim is to restore sand dunes across the UK. So we're working in seven different locations um, and help people reconnect with nature and wildlife. Um, and restore these sand dunes to be uh, dynamic and, and moving. And um, yeah, so it's a really exciting project. It's funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the EU Life Programme. And um, we have a talk coming up in a month's time. So that'll be on the 19th of April. Um, Chris uh, Kolonko, so he's, uh, it will be speaking and talking about understanding and interpreting Second World War coastal crust defences with Citizens. So Citizens is a project who've been working for quite a while and uh, doing a lot of community engagement and exploring the Lincolnshire coast. So that would be really fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, it should be good. And obviously I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust. So if you want that fuzzy feeling of supporting a charity, um, all our work is, is done and, and supported by our members. Um, so if you're interested, do head to the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust website. Um, we're making a lot of really big changes at the moment. A lot of things are happening and it's very, it's a very exciting time to be involved in conservation. Um, so thank you to Caitlin and thank you to everyone else who's joined today. I think, um, yeah, that's fantastic. Enjoy the rest of your evening and um, see you in a month's time. <laughs> thank you very much.